Hello everyone and welcome back to Talking Pictures. I'm your host Tim Rosenberger and today we're going to be talking about the films of Guillermo del Toro. That's in connection with the currently released Shape of Water which is his 10th film. So I thought it would be a good idea with reaching such landmark for him anyway. It would be a good idea to go through his films. And today to do that my discussion mate is going to be a friend of mine who is also the founder and runner of of deltorofilms.com. That is the official fan site of Guillermo del Toro. And please welcome my friend Parker. Parker, thanks for being with me today. Thanks for having me. To start off, Parker, how did you get into del Toro? Was it with Blade 2? You know what? No, I think it was Mimic going back many, many years. I was a big fan of Roger Ebert and reading his reviews, and he gave Mimic a really good review. And it sounded like a movie that I would really get into. And so I saw it and I'd never seen a horror movie quite like that one. It just had such a unique visual style that immediately I started to research Guillermo del Toro and found out that he had also done a movie called Kronos. And then I knew he was coming out with Blade 2 eventually. And so when I got on Blade 2, I was sold. That was when I really became a big fan. And about the time Hellboy rolled out was when we started doing the deltorofilms.com website. You talked about Mimic being kind of a unique horror film. What about it was so unique? The visual style was great. The colors, you know, all the landmark Guillermo del Toro stuff that's kind of his signature. The blues and the sepia. Every shot seemed like a painting, almost. One of my favorite shots is at the beginning of the film when they're in the, like, the ward where all the people are sick and the white silk screens are over the beds. And it's just such a great shot. And I think he's such a good craftsman. And so, you know, even something as simple as, you know, reaching your hand through the crack of a wall stands the hairs on your arms up. And so I just love the movie. It fulfilled me in a lot of different ways. You know, it was a fun horror movie, which I love that stuff, but it was also a feast for the eyes. Being kind of a cinemaphile, I just made sure that next time I heard of the work that he was doing, I wanted to find out more because I enjoyed it so much. It's worth noting that Guillermo is involved with the site when he can be. How long did it take after you created the site for him to get connected with you? I was kind of came in late to the game, <laughs> you could say. So Guillermo already had like a really strong group of followers who had seen Kronos, they'd seen Mimic, they'd seen Devil's Backbone. And I started to kind of engage in that fan group when Hellboy came out. So Sony Pictures put up a website for the Hellboy movie. And on that website, they had a message board. And so I would get on the message board and just kind of interact with some of the people that you and I know. And Guillermo was on there as well. He was answering questions. And at one point, he even posted his email address on the message board and said, hey, if anybody wants to email me, here's my email address. And this was before he became Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> you know, Oscar nominated director. This was, you know, really at the beginning of his Hollywood American stage of his career. And I emailed him and just said, hey, I really like your stuff. I first saw you back on Mimic and just told him how much I appreciated it. And he wrote me back. And so from there, we kind of had kind of a, an acquaintanceship, I guess you would say. So after Hellboy was over, I was kind of worried that they were going to shut down the Hellboy message boards. And I happened to be a web programmer at that time. And so I volunteered to set up a new website for our little group, call it deltorofilms.com and set up a message board. I asked Guillermo, I was like, hey, if I set up this website and move everybody off of the Sony boards, would you be in favor of that? And he said, absolutely. In fact, I'll endorse it. And so that's how we kind of came up with Del Toro Films and how it became kind of the official fan site. And so we've been running that since late 2004. My first exposure to Del Toro was through Hellboy. Got more into him with Pan's Labyrinth than I met you and everybody else during the Hellboy 2 stuff. And it just kind of snowballed from there. So the first Hellboy for me also was a big landmark to kind of jump on, really. What we're going to do is we're just going to go through all 10 of his films. And we're going to start with Kronos, which came out in 94. 1993, I think. And that was his first film. It was filmed in Mexico. And basically a probably 50-something-year-old shopkeeper in Mexico. He 
finds this device, which we later find out is called the Kronos device. It's in his palm, and a stainer, for lack of a better word, comes out, goes into his arm, and he gets the thing out, blah, 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 but he later finds himself addicted to it, and weird things start happening to him. Meanwhile, a wealthy, eccentric, and dying factory owner in Mexico and his nephew, I think, played by Ron Perlman, are trying to get this device from this old man who is played by Frederico Lupi. Well, that's probably the movie that the least people, at least in the United States, have seen. When you mention it, people are like, oh... I didn't even know about that one. Yeah, he didn't really get onto the map until, like, possibly Mimic, more likely Devil's Backbone, and then more from there. But I think it's a shame that a lot of people don't know about Kronos, because I've always been very fond of this film. It's obviously his first film. There's a lot of things to work out, and he hasn't quite worked out his visual style yet. I mean, it's there. Like, the, his strong use of colors is there, but it's not as prominent as it would become even in the very next film. But a lot of his landmark stuff is there. His obsession with monsters monsters, his obsession with insects, things in jars, clockwork mm -hmm. in gears. Ron Perlman's in the film, Frederico Lupi is in the film, his cinematographer is Guillermo Navarro. There's themes of choice and time and youth and age. So a lot of the landmarks of what would become his films is present in this very first one. But no, I always, I mean, this was one of the later films I had watched of his, because I watched them all out of order. Yeah, me too. For some reason, I always find it very nostalgic watching this film. I don't know if it's because it's his first film or what. And it's a unique film of a genre. Well, what are your thoughts about it? It's one of the movies that I really like to go back to. You know, I think his career falls into kind of two different areas, although there, I think he's starting to blend a little bit now, but he'd always had kind of his small Spanish language films that were his very personal movies for him. It dealt with a lot of the things that he's passionate about, as you mentioned, monsters and big ideas around death and immortality and, and things of that nature. And there's the other movie movies that are kind of like the big blockbuster or popcorn movies like Hellboy, Hellboy 2. You know, even though that his DNA is in all those types of movies. But the movies I really like to go back to are those small personal movies. I find those explore the most interesting ideas. And so in Kronos, for me, you see kind of the first glimpse of a theme that appears in a number of his small movies, which is this idea that there's an old person who's searching for immortality. And so this is huge in the Strain series, the television television series in the books, the idea of this person who's looking to find a way to become immortal. But then it's also recurring in Pan's Labyrinth, where the person who becomes immortal is the person who doesn't seek it. I found those themes really, really interesting. The opening shot of the movie is fantastic. It's a man being drained of blood and being hung upside down in a room. And there's a story about the person who invented the Kronos device, who's a very mysterious person who was said to have lived a very, very long time. So the setup is fantastic. The coolest part for me is it taps into Guillermo's love of vampires and one of the things that he thinks is really cool is the thirst it's unquenchable thirst that these creatures have and there's that signature scene in Kronos where there's blood on the tile of a bathroom and the antique dealer can't help himself he crawls on the floor of the bathroom and licks it up with his tongue <laughs> and it's such a cool shot and it's just totally del Toro he's a risk taker and he does things that will make you queasy and just as often as doing things that will make you think and making you love and all those emotions that these movies invoke. Well, I mean, one of the nice things about it is not, not just that it's a vampire type story, but it, he describes it as kind of like a poor man's vampire. The fact mm -hmm. that he can't even get blood from somebody he has to, because a guy comes into the bathroom, cuts his hand, and then he leaves, and then Frederico Lupi's character is trying to get some of it. So he can't even get blood from somebody. Later, he doesn't even have anything like a coffin. They have to use a toy chest. Yeah, he's yeah. kind of an incompetent vampire. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, what do you do when you have nobody to teach you how to be this thing that you're becoming, right? But, and at the same time, something that you don't even want to be even. I mean, he doesn't want to hurt anybody, but at the same mm -hmm. time, he's having this incredible urge to drink blood and all that stuff. I'd encourage anybody who's listening to this podcast, if they're a Del Toro fan, to seek that one out. It's a must if you're a Del Toro fan. It's got a lot of the same type of stuff that he's done throughout his career. But you can see it you know, at a very early stage where he's just figuring things out, and it's low budget, but it's still a lot of fun. So his next film was made a few years later in 1997. That was Mimic. And a little backstory on that film. That was made with Miramax and the Weinstein Company. And the problem Del Toro ran in with that, he shot a good deal of the movie, but he was running into a lot of trouble with 
the Weinsteins who are being very controlling of the film and demanding this and demanding that. So eventually they shot what was left of the film at that point without him with a second unit director and they released it. He was not happy with the final product because he didn't get to shoot everything he wanted to shoot. He didn't get to edit it the way he wanted to. Somebody else was shooting major scenes and I don't think he necessarily disowned it but he was very unhappy about that for a long time but back in oh maybe 2011 or something like that they did release a director's cut of the film which to the best of his ability restored as much as he could that he shot and cut out stuff that he didn't like kind of give the best version that we're ever going to get of that film so you seen both versions of it parker i have i couldn't pick out a lot of the differences i think pretty much they trimmed out a bunch of the stuff that he didn't like there wasn't much in extra scenes that they could add in there's some stuff there's a pregnancy subplot that was totally well almost entirely cut from the theatrical version of it that's added back in there's some character introductions that are there's different scenes that they use for that and there's some stuff here and there it's not a major difference Mm -hmm. i think in most part there was improvements made mimic is about there's a plague that's hitting new york and the source of that plague is coming from these insects and so mira sorvino plays a scientist who develops this combative insect that is genetically engineered to invade and kill those plague causing insects and so she releases these genetically enhanced cockroaches into the wild to basically ward off the plague and it works but years later they find out something very interesting these cockroaches which were designed to mimic their prey have evolved and they find out that people start going missing in the sewers and henceforth becomes an action movie thriller with Mira Sorvino, Josh Brolin, Carl Dutton, some really good actors. Now you mentioned earlier you mentioned the visual style of this film and this is really when his visual style starts to evolve so to speak and it is a very good Good looking movie. I think you mentioned there's a great use of yellow when they start to go down and stuff and they have like subway lights and all that stuff. So it's the start of his use of really, I don't want to say in your face, but really obvious colors. And I think he said on this film was when he started to try to have a mobile camera as much as possible. It was very, very clear that Miramax just didn't get him. And I think one of the big sticking points that the Weinsteins had was taking such care and crafting these beautiful visual scenes. That's kind of his thing. I mean, he really spends a lot of time on the visual storytelling and the color and making every frame look like a painting. And the Weinsteins were kind of like, what are you doing? You're just making a horror movie here. And I think that was a problem. Yeah, I think he said they wanted him to make a giant bug movie, and he was kind Mm -hmm. of against that. But eventually he was like, okay, I guess I'll go with that the best I can. His thing was if he was going to make a giant bug movie, he was going to make the best darn giant bug movie that he could. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't say darn either. Well, no, he probably didn't say darn. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Listen to the Mimic Director's Cut audio commentary for people out there and you'll hear that story. One of the things I love about him, and I think a lot of people love about him, is he does take time with all of his films. He puts everything he has into the films, even if it's something like Mimic or later things like Hellboy, which on the surface, again, maybe not, aren't very much, but if you put the time into them, you can have some really great things. So, yeah, he puts a lot of time into this one, and, I mean, sadly, we don't have the film that he wanted, even with the director's mm-hmm. cuts, and hearing his plan for what this film could have been and what this film was going to be, I think it would have been much improved over what we have. I don't know about you, but I always get the impression, it always seems like it's to be a much bigger movie than it actually turns out to be. It starts off mm-hmm. with big questions about genetically engineering this, kind of maybe elements of Frankenstein, in terms of science doing something that maybe Maybe it shouldn't have done. And it seems like it's going to start off, it could be big and philosophical and pose all these questions. And then for me, it kind of devolves into a survival movie, which mm-hmm. might be okay. But the characters in this film, I care the least about out of any Del Toro film, which I think mm-hmm. is just because they aren't developed very well. They're just kind of very, very, very basic personalities with, I mean, great actors, but you're right. This is kind of the movie that got away and you can see probably the movie that he was building towards until the studio stepped in and kind of changed what he was going for. I know he's talked about religion being something that's 
a part of this movie. He had this idea that the bugs were now God's favorite creatures. And it was kind of a symbol of the downfall of human race and humankind falling out of favor in the eyes of God. So he had some really big ideas to play with that he just didn't get a chance to follow through on. Not as much to grab onto with this film. I think that's really it's just because he wasn't able to do what he wanted. So this is, for me, the least fulfilling out of all of his movies just because he didn't get to do what he wanted to do, and it's sad. Mm-hmm. But this is at least the director's cut out there, and I think he's happy-ish with that. And uh, one thing I would add is go out there and look up the Roger Ebert mimic review online, and you can see where Roger Ebert called Guillermo's career. He pretty much said this is a director to look out for, even from a movie that was not completely baked. He saw the potential that Guillermo had and totally called it. Let's see, the next film is, again, a few years later. 2001 was when it came out. It was Devil's Backbone. And this film, I think, is a very, 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 very important one if you're talking about his movies. And I think he'll tell you that. I've heard him say a few times that Devil's Backbone, which was, again, a, it's a Spanish-language film. It's set in Spain, 1939, during the Spanish Civil War. And it starts off with a boy, an orphan boy. He's being taken to an orphanage in the middle of nowhere in this big old building. And immediately when he gets there, he sees what looks to be a ghost. And in the meantime, one of the older boys does not like him very much and threatens him with violence a few times. There's a caretaker who is trying to find a stash of gold that the runner of this orphanage has. And the boy, in the meantime, is trying to figure out what's going on with this ghost. There's a whole mystery angle there. There's elements of war. There's elements of romance. And the reason why this one is important is Del Toro said this is probably the first of his films that's really, I think, him. I think it's when he really started to solidify his style and his voice Mm -hmm. and everything. He's really very fond of this film. I think it's still one of his favorite films that he made and it touches on his love of gothic romance but what did you think of this film when you first saw it parker this was the movie that really opened my eyes to what he was capable of as an artist i mean it is a very beautiful movie i mean at this point he's done chronos he's done mimic and the devil's backbone was a huge leap from those two movies as far as style and the depth the story and the characters you know he often talks about this movie having saved his life he had basically come off mimic and thought his career was in shambles and he was never going to make another movie again and he was lucky enough to find a producer who was a huge fan of chronos that wanted to make another movie with him and supported him in a way that miramax didn't and let him really bring this movie to life. So Kronos was restricted by his resources at the time. He couldn't do everything he wanted to do. He just didn't have the money for it. It was low budget. And then Mimic was it was held back by the studio. and They didn't let him really put the vision out there that he wanted. But Devil's Back one was the first time that he could really spread his wings and had a partner that was supportive of that. And what we saw on the screen was the first real taste of what was to come as far as his other films. So in a lot of the same themes that seem to recur. He likes to play off of the things that he loves. You mentioned like gothic romance and such, but he's always looking to twist it a little bit and make it a little different. And this was the first time we really saw that duality of the monster not being the actual supernatural thing. A monster is a character that's human, and we see that throughout as a recurring theme. I recommend if people can, if it's ever showing in a theater that you can get to, watch with the crowd. If you watch it with the crowd, you can really see it's a very serious film, but there's also a lot of humor in it too. So I recommend that because the experience of watching this film with the audience, I think, is maybe more than any of his other films is really rewarding. Just going back to visual style, this is the type of movie that I really like of Guillermo's because it's so layered. There's like the story that's being told, but there's so much in the movie itself visually that support the story that, you know, maybe you don't catch the first or second or th- even third viewing of the film. And so going back to Guillermo's movies is my favorite thing. Like I like to watch it and see what I don't catch the first time and see how he uses things like the bomb and the courtyard to be a part of the story you know how he takes a different spin on a ghost and you know instead of having 
a cracked skull. It's like a porcelain doll, his face. Like the ghost has this head wound. It's shattered like porcelain rather than, you know, just like a bloody stump. You mentioned his visual style again. And he's a director who I think would be very good at silent films because his movies are often very, very visual. And sometimes he'll do all his storytelling through the camera. He depends so much on the visuals of his movie, just as much, maybe sometimes more, as his dialogue. So his next film was Blade 2, and that came out the very next year in 2002. That was his second Hollywood film. He did not write this one. Oh, he made some additions here and there, but he was primarily not the writer of that. That was David Mm -hmm. S. Goyer, who wrote the first one, which was directed by Steve Norrington. And this one probably has the least Guillermo in it. It's still very much his film, but it has the least of him in it, probably just because he wasn't the primary writer and he had very little to do with the writing process of the film. But why don't you tell us a little bit about what this one is about, Parker? So this one is a sequel to the original Blade, which is a Marvel comic comics character, a, basically a, a hybrid vampire hunter played by Wesley Snipes and pure action movie, the plot of which is that there is a new breed of vampires that are plaguing the landscape, and these are much nastier than the typical fang vampires that Blade is used to dealing with. These things are monsters with long tongues and features that are built specifically for draining blood, and so they're quite awful, and they spread like wildfire, and they feed actually on other vampires which makes them pretty unique. So this is a another action packed type movie. This was one of the movies that really got me fired up for Guillermo just because I thought he was did an excellent job directing the action and gave us creatures that I had never seen before. They were completely unique and re-energized a vampire cliche <laughs> and he's continued to do that. There's a reason that these things are very similar to the creatures that we saw on the TV show The Strange that he co-created with Chuck Hogan. He's got a passion for vampires, and he wanted to do this movie really for two reasons. One was he wanted to make Hellboy. That was kind of like his passion project. And he got some good advice that said, you know, you're not going to be able to make Hellboy just based on Mimic and Kronos. You're going to have to go out there and do something and show people that you could handle a movie like that. And so that was one of the reasons he took Blade 2. And the other reason was he loved the vampires. He wanted to do his own thing, and he had this idea that he'd been crafting in his head since the 1980s about these strange vampires with tongues that come out of their mouths and they're a perfect blood-sucking machine and they're horrible (laughs) and parasitic and they spread like a virus and that's something that he wanted to bring to this movie and eventually evolved into the strain later. You described this as an action film, and this is really is. It's a pure action movie. It's the least story-focused out of all of his movies, which is fine because it's probably the most fun out of all of his movies. It's pretty much nonstop action. Yeah, it's Blade. It's a trio of bad vampires led by Ron Perlman, who Blade is teaming up with to take care of these creatures who are much as a danger to people as they are to vampires. Yeah, this movie is a lot of fun. One of the things he said he wanted to do with it was he wanted to vary up the fight. He didn't want to just make the fights all the same throughout the movie because he thought that would be kind of boring. So all the fights are different. Some are really just fast pace in terms of Blade doesn't really care he just wants to get it over with some he's more playful some are more martial arts based some are more just two people in a fist fight based there's a lot of variety in the action but it's all equally just fun and over the top I think somebody said it's almost like basically a live action anime or something as somebody who's just kind of a movie fan that just loves sometimes just to eat popcorn and enjoy some action I always really loved Blade 2 I just always thought it was a fun movie I think something that gets unnoticed is Luke Goss's performance as Nomak. Yeah, he plays the lead of these parasitic vampires, yeah. He's really good in this, and his character is another recurring theme. Like, this is things that we see over and over again in Guillermo's movies. This one being the sympathetic villain. He's a villain. He's the bad guy. He's causing a lot of problems, but he's got a really good reason. And so Guillermo's always was closely identified with the Nomak character, much more so than the Wesley Snipes character. He kind of always said, Wesley, I don't understand Blade. You understand and you go do your thing. Guillermo's focus in this movie was on Nomak. I think he said one of the upsides of doing this film for him was that it wasn't the first film. Everything was kind of laid out for him already, so he could just kind of have fun with it. Mm-hmm. 
I think he is having a lot of fun with it. Again, it's not his most personal film by any means, but I mean, really, if you want to just have fun watching a film and kind of turn mm-hmm. your brain off a bit, I mean, really go check this film out. You know, one thing I just add real quick yeah. is just you're looking at his career of movies. Guillermo's very much a student of film, unbelievably so. He's like an encyclopedia, and he uses each of his films as an opportunity to learn something new. And so everything that he does, even the Blade Twos, opens the door towards new techniques and new ways to solve different problems in future films. And so this for him was his first real kind of action Hollywood movie, and it opened the door and gave him confidence to do Hellboy, Hellboy 2, Crimson Peak, and those kind of things. Talking about his love of film, he will put in kind of references to other, well, not just films, but things of literature and comics and all that. Like, in terms of film and this one, there's references to stuff like Nosferatu, I think he said in one of the fight scenes, it's almost kind of like a Gene Kelly, American in Paris type dance mm-hmm. sequence almost. So it's not a so much homages in such overt ways as uh, somebody like Quentin Tarantino, who if you know film, mm-hmm. there's a lot of very obvious callbacks to other films. Some of these are, can be often more subtle for Del Toro's films, but if you know what you're looking for, you can see that he really big student of film and he just puts stuff everywhere for people who care to look so his next movie after this was hellboy which came out 2004 stars ron perlman as the title character of hellboy who is a creature from a you could say hell but you can also say demon dimension who is found by a group of american soldiers and scientists in 1944 Four, after the Nazis have recruited Rasputin to basically help them win the war through supernatural science fiction type ways. And Hellboy is raised from a young baby to an adult. The line they use in the film is that he ages in reverse dog years. So it's 60 years later, but he's still kind of in his 20s, 30s. And Hellboy, when he's grown up, works for the Bureau of Paranormal Research and Defense which is headed in a way by his foster father, Professor Broom, who's played wonderfully by the great lady John Hurt. And Hellboy is helped in the Bureau by various human agents and by a fish man creature called Abe Sapien, who is played by Doug Jones. Doug Jones is unfortunately dubbed over by David Hyde Pierce. He does mm-hmm. a great job. That's right. But it is not his vocal performance, unfortunately. That was a studio mandate that backfired on them because David I. Pierce declined to have screen credits. So there was no name to attach to the film, which was the whole point in casting David I. Pierce. Anyway, there was also Hellboy's kind of on again, off again girlfriend, played by Selma Blair. Her name is Liz Sherman, who has fire powers, but saying she can, can control fire is a bit of an overstatement. And there was a new human agent, John Myers, and um, he has come on and he's supposed to be Hellboy. Boy's new main keeper, as it were, and there's reasons behind that which you'll learn as you watch the film. And Hellboy and the team are trying to stop this creature that has been unleashed. It leads to Rasputin, a guy with knives called Cronin, and so I think this film is possibly a candidate for, I think, the best-looking Del Toro film, for at least for me. I think it's probably his best work with Navarro, and I think it's an excellent mixture of supernatural, like, has great monsters in it. Uh, Ron Perlman gives a great performance in it, which I think Jeffrey Tambor gave a great description of the Ron Perlman's performance in the movie is that he doesn't wink in the movie. In other words, he's playing it seriously. So, yeah, for me, this is very high on my list of his films, and uh, it's just a great mixture of drama, horror, comedy. It's a good adaption of the comics by Mike Mignola. So what are some of your thoughts on the film? So Hellboy, like you mentioned, this was the movie I was really excited to see because I was a fan of the Mignola character. I thought it was just a great concept, and I really had no idea how they were going to pull off (laughs) this idea in a movie. You know, Beast of the Apocalypse, who's working for the Bureau of Paranormal Research and Defense and fighting monsters. It all sounded really cool, and I was excited to see it. And I think that's what really drew Guillermo to this project is, you know, I think he just wanted to play in that sandbox. This was like his passion project that he wanted to do, that he fought for, you know, even to the point where he was not going to make it without Ron Perlman, because in his head, Ron was the perfect Hellboy. So for me in this movie, it's all about the creatures. It's the costume and set design and the makeup effects make it for me. Just seeing Ron Perlman in the Hellboy get up, the beautiful Abe Sapien. In my opinion, that's Guillermo's best fish man. 
I think that's the best looking fish man. I think it's probably the best prosthetic makeup work in all of his films. It is a gorgeous bit of work there. They make it an Oscar nod for The Shape of Water, but I still roll with Abe. And his chance to create a large Lovecraftian monster. <laughs> so I think the movie's just fun. It's funny. Ron Perlman's just oozes charisma. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a pleasure to watch. He's got kind of like that Bruce Campbell bravado with comedy, and so it's a fun movie. It was at the time. I think it still is. Hellboy is his favorite superhero, so there's a lot of love and attention put into this. Like Mimic, there is a theatrical version of this and a director's cut version of this. The theatrical version is approved by Del Toro, so it is not something he is displeased with. I would recommend if people go out and see it or try to check it out, do you watch the director's cut? It's not like a Lord of the Rings extended cut thing where it's mm -hmm. big differences but a lot of additional scenes that add a lot of nice touches like John Hurt and Hellboys their characters their relationship their father son thing is expanded upon in the director's cut there's a lot more beats to that story it's more of a satisfying cut to me both cuts are good but if you can check out the director's cut I think that's the better one of the bunch and as always with a Guillermo movie, there's layers to it. The more you watch it, the more you pull stuff out, the more you start to recognize things in this movie. You know, I can tell you right now that you may notice something that's in this movie that you'll also see in The Shape of Water. His next film was made in 2006, was Pan's Labyrinth, which the actual translated title of that film is The Labyrinth of the Fawn. Again, Spanish language film was again set in Spain. It had been in real time five years since he did Devil's Backbone. He thought it would be interesting in movie time to have it set five years after Devil's Backbone. So this one takes place in 1944, near the end of the Spanish Civil War. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, and I am not an expert on the Spanish Civil War, so people can correct me <laughs> on this, but I believe the dictator side of that was winning and the the other side was not. So the kind of rebels were in very kind of dire straits at this time. But he often thinks of this film as kind of like a brother or sister film to Devil's Backbone. And it probably technically takes place in the same universe as Devil's Backbone. Because there are cameos from two characters from Devil's Backbone, which if you look hard, you can spot. And it has a lot of similar things to Devil's Backbone. It starts with a kid, in this case a little girl, who is with her mother, so she's not an orphan, but she's taken with her mother to a specific location. In this case, it's a, kind of an army base location for the dictator side, and it's headed by a very despicable, violent man who is the captain of the operation, who has married a little girl's mother, Ophelia, Ophelia's mother and they're going to live on this base while her mother is pregnant. Also, there's a kindly doctor character, there's a kindly maid cook character. They're both secretly taking supplies to the rebel forces under the captain's nose. And Ophelia stumbles upon a labyrinth, which is on the property, and she meets a character named just the Fawn, who is again played by Doug Jones, who plays jewel roles in this film. And the Fawn tells her that in another life she was a princess of a magical kingdom, and and in order to reclaim the mantle of princess and to become immortal, she must complete three tasks which are dangerous and will endanger her life. Again, there's elements of the Spanish Civil War in there. Like Parker mentioned, there are monsters in this film, but really, for the most part, the real monster in this film is the captain, who Del Toro purposefully made scarier and more violent and crazy than any of the actual monsters in the movie. And I think this is probably... I mean, it got nominated for Best Foreign Film at the Oscars. It's probably one of, if not his most critically acclaimed film that he ever made really put him on the map I think more than any of his other films at that point and I think there's a really good reason for that because it is a fantastic film people describe it as the time as a fairy tale for adults and it is very much a fairy tale so Pan's Labyrinth is, gosh, it's probably my favorite Del Toro movie so far. It's gorgeous, it's powerful, it's brutal, and it's completely unique. It's unlike anything I had ever seen before. The fawn and the characters, you know, I don't know if anybody had attempted anything like this before as far as an adult fairy tale. Nothing comes to mind. There may be some things out there that I'm sure inspired him, but just as much as the spectacle of it, I deeply appreciate his dedication to really making a fairy tale. Like he researched, he's a huge fan.
fan of fairy tales for one, but the amount of academic research he did and note taking in crafting a fairy tale. I think he at length would write out, you know, everything that makes up a fairy tale. The rule of three, the princess, all these different aspects of what a fairy tale is and kind of wove this story around it's built around fascism and how that's such an awful, awful thing for the people who live under it. And uh, this is uh, something he's done in probably three of his last five movies. He's made basically a fairy tale between Pan's Labyrinth, Hellboy 2, which is has very strong fairy tale elements to it and The Shape of Water where there's like the real world is living in juxtaposition of this fantasy world and the two worlds are colliding in interesting ways and certainly this is a perfect example of that and there's so much in it it's again it's one of those movies that requires repeated viewings you mentioned his studying of fairy tales and yes he is a big fan of fairy tales he's a big fan of the darker fairy tales like the brothers Grimm and stuff like that and he doesn't just know like elements of fairy tales like princess and the rule of three and stuff which are present in this film but he also just knows how fairy tales are structured and elements that you probably wouldn't notice unless you really studied fairy tales and he's really studied fairy tales and the look of this film is very Guillermo you're not really going to see anything else like it from anybody else from the look of the film to the creature design of the film to just how he mixes fantasy with brutal reality. And it should be said that people that are screamish, this is a very, 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 very violent. But I think violence with a point, which is one thing I like about him, is that he doesn't just have violence for violence's sake. He has violence that may be like Blade 2, which is kind of gory, but over the top and cartoonish and fun. But then you'll have very realistic, brutal violence like this that has a message to it and has to do with the story and the characters and what this little girl is going through, the type of world she lives in, and the type of world she wants to escape. So just go and watch it. There's a reason why this is probably his most hailed film. Really go check it out if you haven't already. So his next film was Hellboy 2, which is 2008. Unlike the first film, which is very much creatures coming into the human role, this one is human slash our team of supernatural people going into the world of these creatures. There is a elf prince played by Ukas, and uh, he is the twin of a princess who is Prince Nuala. The prince is elven people made a pact with the human race a long time ago that they would end their warring feud with each other and the supernatural creatures would stick to the forest and the humans would stick to the cities. And humans have encroached on the supernatural creatures over time mm -hmm. to the point where the elven king is basically his you know, this old, almost sewer type underground place. And Prince Nuada wants to reclaim the world for the supernatural creatures and is trying to find three pieces to a crown which will allow him to control the elven created golden army which is this unstoppable force of mechanical supernatural creatures and Hellboy Abe who is voiced by Doug Jones in this one as well as acted physically by him and uh, Sherman and a new addition to the team Johan Krauss which is a ectoplasmic researcher who has lost his body through means we're not quite told and his ectoplasmic form is contained in this containment suit this film i've always had a problem with and i had a big problem with it when i watched it recently for this podcast it has a very different tone to the first one this one is much more of a comedy than the first one is yeah and i mm -hmm. think very that, much so yeah and i think that's a bit of a problem because all the characters had a seriousness to themselves in the first one and that's still kind of there in this film but they've all become very silly in this film and it's much more i think somebody described it kind of like as a sitcom almost a sitcom like antics and that's i think kind of true and the visuals of this movie are stellar and it's him with some of his best work and some of his best creature design and it's very 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 him but the silliness of the movie and the humor, which doesn't quite work for me in most cases, I think is a big problem. Was that a problem for you, the lighter tone of the movie? I don't think it was. I liked it just fine. But I've gone back and watched the first Hellboy. That one, to me, hasn't aged as well as the second one. Sometimes I feel like the first one was kind of over-serious at times. So I think you and I are probably on opposite sides of the spectrum. I thought the humor was fine. I enjoyed it. I took it for what it was. I think Guillermo was just playing in that sandbox again, and he loves the opportunity to get involved in the costume design and the character design, especially, and the special effects and makeup. And he and Mike Mignola wanted to make a second Hellboy boy and i think they struggle a little bit trying to figure out what 
kind of story they wanted to tell. And I think what they ended up landing on was they wanted to step away really from the Hellboy mythology, because that was kind of what was told in the first one, which is, you know, who is he? What makes a man a man? What's his place in the human world? And it's very much based off of the first Hellboy comic too. Right. Yeah, very much so. And so that story was told, you know, you can't really jump right to the end. (laughs) <laughs> so what's the story that's in between? I think what they settled on was Hellboy kind of struggling with whose side is he on? He's not a human by any means, but he sides with them. Is he in the right place? And with that, kind of the basis of the story, giving Guillermo another opportunity to play in the fairy tale world, which we know he loves, and play in the monster world. You know, if there's a downside for me, it's I don't have any closure from Hellboy 2. You know, Guillermo never got to make his third film, Mignola's Moved On and is doing kind of a reboot. So that's the only reason it's not a favorite of mine. Yeah, it should be said he was going to do a third Hellboy film, which was going to, I think, deal with Hellboy, who has had this prophecy of bringing about the apocalypse, which is talked about very heavily in the first film, Mr. Rasputin, and it's talked a little bit about in the second film, but not as much. That was finally going to kind of come to fruition in the third film, which was also going to expand on Johan's character and tell his origins, which are only briefly hinted at in the second film which is what I really wanted to see. But yeah, it was always something that fans wanted to see. It was always something hanging over his films was when, or if he was ever going to be able to make a third Hellboy film. It is disappointing. In a way, it's kind of at least nice to know now that it's not going to happen just because before with every film he made i was like okay i'm interested in this film but ron perlman wasn't getting any younger and Mm -hmm. the more time they spent on it the least likely he was going to be able to do it so it was always impatience to be like oh come on do hellboy 3 do hellboy 3 if you can so to finally not have to worry about that is at least nice so for me there's a upside to that but yes it is sad not to see the seeds that he plants in this film flower into what he wanted to do and it would be nice to see what he was planning for Hellboy's end so this was in 2008 and his next film did not come out until 2012 and that was not by planning that was because he was the director that was originally picked to do The Hobbit the two films that later become three films a prequel to Lord of the Rings and he came on board to do that he co-wrote it with Peter Jackson and their other writers he worked on that for probably at least a couple years if not more and they did not green light the film they did not green light the film eventually he had to leave because he was tired of waiting around so he left those films was made without him and then finally he came back in 2012 with a film that i think i don't know if anybody was expecting because it was very i think unlike anything we had seen from him and Mm -hmm. it really wasn't any hints that he was interested in this type of film before because it was specific rim which is about these giant building skyscraper sized creatures coming from a portal under the pacific ocean and the world has built these giant for lack of a better word kind of robots that are called Jaegers, which are piloted by two different pilots, and they use those to fight back the creatures. Charlie Hunnam stars in the film, along with an Asian actress whose name I don't remember, because my memory is terrible. Also stars Idris Elba. Ron Perlman is back for this film as a very eccentric man who is takes apart these kaijus, these monsters, that's what the monsters are called. He takes apart these kaiju and uses their body parts and fluids to sell on the black market. And Charlie Day is in this film. And this film, again, it kind of goes back to his more action-y roots. It's still very much a personal film for him, but... It is more of an action movie, and it was him telling a story with something that I think the public at large didn't know he was passionate about, which is the genre of giant robots fighting other giant things, which he is very passionate about, but he had not talked about or had elements of in his previous films. So after such a long wait, did you have high expectations for this film? You know what? I don't know if I knew what to expect at all. When it was announced, and I kind of read the description, I was having a hard time picture where his interest was in this. It was so different than anything else he'd done, which has been fairy tales, comic books, and then his kind of deeply personal small films. This was like a big blockbuster, huge budget action movie with giant robots. And it kind of came down to what you said. It's he had kind of this passion for kaiju, the giant monsters, 
and the mechs of anime that you know i just wasn't aware of his passion for that and you could tell he was really excited for this movie i was lucky enough to be on set and he let me visit one day and i got to talk to him a little bit he showed me kind of a preview of what the jaegers were going to look like he had kind of like some early computer graphics that he was just so excited about so you could just see that this was you know a man and his toys (laughs) and uh, i think that was kind of his attraction to doing that film it's a broader film but there's obviously a love of things like godzilla and i think this maybe kind of revitalized interest in those types of films not too long after that they did the reboot of godzilla and obviously recently we've had the king kong remake which is weird because the movie didn't do great at least domestically in the united states it did really well overseas yeah in the asian countries it did very very well which is i think probably one of the reasons why they decided to do a sequel oh yeah no question i was blown away by the special effects in this i mean they were really incredible, and you know, I got a chance to see it in 3D on the big screen and everything. It was just, the special effects were amazing. I know that they brought Lucasfilm in to work on it, and a huge chunk of their budget was doing all the creature and robot battles in this movie. But the story itself was nothing, you know, real meaty. I mean, it was, you know, really the movie to me was just about getting these monsters to fight each other, which was cool and it was fun, but the movie itself didn't resonate with me as much from a story story standpoint is even like Hellboy. The story is weaker in this one. The characters are weaker. I will say the, it's never been a favorite of mine. My wife has always liked it more. I still enjoy it. I will say the last time I watched it, just again just recently, I, I don't know, for, for whatever reason, I really got into a groove with it and I enjoyed it much more than I ever have before. Because it does, after the initial kind of Jaeger kaiju fight, it takes a long time to get to the next one. And I don't think the characters quite hold the interest for you, at least for me, most of the time when I watch it, they don't hold my interest, keep me from waiting for the next Jaeger Kaiju fight. But I mean, eventually you get there. But I think, especially if you're just looking for a film with giant robots fighting giant monsters, you'll probably want a little bit more of that. At the same time, I get what he was probably doing, which was building suspense, building characters, and stuff like that. But I don't think he did quite a good enough job with that. At least for me, when I watched it for the first time, I was getting very restless. And I was mm-hmm. wanting to see the next fight scene. Yeah, and I'm not a a huge fan of Charlie Hunnam's. I feel like he's lacking some charisma that's needed in a leading man. Now, I did see uh, Green Street Hooligans that he was in, and he was incredible in that. But for whatever reason, I don't think Guillermo's got him the right part. Well, I think it's partially it's a script problem, too. Because Guillermo it could be. and the co-writer Travis Beecham, I want to say. I think their script is a bit lacking. So I think I'm not terribly familiar with Charlie Hunnam's work. I mean, I know him and stuff like Sons of Anarchy and all that stuff. I'm not an expert on him, so I don't have tons of experience with how good of he is as an actor. But it's probably maybe partially his fault, too. But I think it's partially the script is just not up to snuff so he's Mm -hmm. maybe hurting a bit because of that and i know a lot of people this isn't their favorite of his films it's certainly not the most overviewed of his movies and i think i know a lot of people maybe have problems with the cliche characters the weak story Mm -hmm. and all that stuff but it's certainly not a bad film but it's him i think struggling a bit i mean he's still making a film he loves and i think he's still very proud of the film but i think it's him stumbling a bit so the next film he did and by the way pacific room was 2013 not 2012 i forgot but anyway the next film he did was two years later and this film was crimson peak and was much more i think what people would expect from him again it's him kind of going back to gothic romance horror ghost stories haunted house type stuff though like he says in the film I think a little bit too on the nose. The character says it's not really a ghost story. It's a story about people and all this other stuff. So that one is about a young American writer during, oh, I forget the exact time period, early 20th century, I think. She's played by Mia Vasakowska. Trump wants to be a writer. People won't take her seriously because she's a woman. And her father is rich-ish manufacturer, maybe like construction type stuff or whatever. I forget exactly what his business does. I think it provides like machinery and stuff for various businesses and people. And there is two people who have come from somewhere in the UK. One played by Tom Hiddleston and the other played by Jessica Chastain. And they are trying to pitch Mia Vaskowska's father in the film, trying to pitch him an idea to get some rare minerals from the property of Tom Hiddleston and Jessica Chastain's family home. The father doesn't go for it, but meanwhile there is something going on with these two and they're planning something nefarious that we don't quite learn for quite some time. And 
and Tom Hiddleston and Mia Vasikowska managed to get married, initially against any sort of wishes of Mia Vasikowska's character, who has no interest in settling down with anybody. And eventually they travel to this great gothic mansion, very much inspired by not this gothic romance books and movies, but also a lot of, I think, haunted mansion. They go to this mansion, and Mia Vasikowska runs across some ghosts. There's a mystery to unfold there. And meanwhile, back at home, a character played by Charlie Hunnam is investigating what exactly is going on with these two mysterious strangers. To start off with his visual work, I think, again, this is one of probably his best-looking films. I agree. Um, Yeah, it was not with Navarro. Brought Dan Laushton back from Mimic. And I'll say this. If you watch this film and don't care about it, in terms of the story or the characters, at least watch it for the visual look of it. Because it is a stunning film. Even, like, the ending credits are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a very good looking film that's why i like it the visuals are so strong that a lot of sense it makes up for some of the weaknesses it has you know this is guillermo playing in another one of his favorite genres of gothic romance and so like fairy tales it follows a certain structure like there's a woman who comes to a house there's usually a man who's been accused of a crime there's usually a secret room there's these beats that you have to hit when you tell a gothic romance story so he's playing that although he's twisting the genre a little bit if you're really familiar with the gothic romance and how it works it doesn't exactly follow as it, you would expect it but uh you know for my tastes i'm not a big gothic romance guy although i love a good ghost story and so i think the ghosts for me are a little few and far between but the ghosts are beautiful but to me it's actually gotten better on repeated viewings like the first time i saw it i was like man that was a gorgeous movie it was good and then i went and saw it again and i was like it was actually really good and then you, know, you made a point about seeing his movies with the right audience. I saw Crimson Peak at Ebert Fest and they were showing that and Guillermo was there for a Q&A and it was the right audience and they were reacting to things that I had missed the first time I saw it. Like there's really subtle humor in this film that if you're watching it intently and you're taking it too seriously you totally miss. There's a right audience for this movie. And Guillermo's talked about how this movie wasn't probably marketed the way he would have liked. It came out around Halloween and they kind of pitched it at a scary movie and like a teenagers went to see it and then trashed it on Twitter because it wasn't what they expected. The, the Eber Fest, it was a very older and refined crowd who were looking for what Guillermo typically offers. And you know, I was stunned that they were laughing at parts. I was like, oh my God, I totally missed that. Like there's a scene where Lucille shows off the painting of her mother, a Jessica Chastain character. And there's a beat where she says like, you know, it's a good likeness or they caught her in the right line. I can't remember what the line was, but they show the painting and it's just this awful looking woman and it was funny and i totally missed it the first time so the details in this film are tremendous and they're things that you just pick up on and you know a lot of times i didn't really realize them until i picked up one of those art of books and started flipping through it and learning about all the things that they did in the movie like you know moths and butterflies are a prevailing theme and that image is spread throughout the house the furniture is moved and shaped in a different way depending on how a character feels it may look like they're sitting in the chair, but they've done something where they've made the chair, they've replaced it with a larger chair to make the character feel weak and small. Just little things like that. And of course, the color and this house is something that's sinking into the ground of this red clay. And so it's oozing red clay. And what they're trying to do is make this house look like a rotting corpse. And all the detail that goes into that is just awesome. Guillermo del Toro is one of the few, if not the only, director that I'm working right now who really takes advantage of the fact that he's making a color film. Most other directors are just making color films, but he's really using color Mm -hmm. more than anybody else to say stuff about the characters, about the story, about the themes. It's a very prominent tool with him, to the point where I think both of us were very interested in whether he would ever make a black and white film. And he has expressed interest in making a black and white film, which I think would be very interesting, because it seems like he would be at a great disadvantage with a film like that. But, yeah, I mean, the color maybe more than any other film are very prominent in this one I will say while the visuals are against some of his best work I think the problem I have with this film and I'm actually the opposite of you I enjoyed this quite a lot when I first saw it it was actually for a short time it became my favorite of his films but my problem with this it's a similar problem I have with Pacific Rim and Hellboy 2 which is that in films like Hellboy and and Labyrinth and some of his other films he had some subtlety in terms of how he got across again his constant theme of choice 
and all these other themes he likes to repeat, there was a lot of subtlety with how he got those across. I think in Hellboy 2, um, Pacific Rim, and Crimson Peak, Crimson Peak being, I think, one of the biggest offenders in the category, he was losing a lot of the subtlety to it, and where the characters were pretty much just saying what the themes were in the dialogue. Like, he had to describe in the film what a gothic romance was, and then Mia Vaskowska talks to Tom Hiddleston's character about how you have a choice and all this stuff, and it was becoming very overt, and if he wants to keep having those themes in his films, I'm fine with that, because that's part of who he is, but it was just becoming too in your face, I think. And it was just becoming, it's like, okay, I get it, but find subtle little ways of doing it because it was just it was almost like he was over explaining to the audience what he was trying to get across so that's and the fact that while this is certainly not in any way a remake of devil's backbone it does share certain similarities to devil's backbone which i think are sometimes a bit too similar and if you've seen devil's backbone you might know how certain things might turn out and stuff like that so those are both problems with me i don't know if they're problems with you or not I don't know if I picked up on that as much. I think at times the pacing was a little slow, and I think some of the twists were telegraphed a little bit, but that may have been because of what I do with the website. I'm really close to it, and it's hard to stay away from <laughs> from spoilers sometimes. But each time I watch Crimson Peak, it grows on me. I think it stands as a work as a master craftsman of a visual storyteller, and there's some of the things from just like a writing standpoint that just uh, continuing to prove on that, you know, it would be great. At some point, I feel like I'm nitpicking, right? It's like some movies you really connect to on a personal level, and some movies you're just not meant to connect to. I see on Twitter and I see on our Del Toro films that absolutely love Crimson Peak. They think it's wonderful, and they create all this fan art, and it just connects with them. And I don't personally connect with everything that Guillermo comes out with, but I appreciate his skill and his aptitude as a filmmaker because he does something with such intelligence and passion. I He's very deliberate in his choices that he makes, and I appreciate that so much. Talking about color, like he's very deliberate about his use of the color red because it draws your attention to it. And so if there is red somewhere in his movie, there's a good chance that he wants to draw your eye to it because he wants you to see it. I just find that sort of thing as a craftsman of film, I find that really interesting. So his final film, well, his most recent film, <laughs> I wouldn't say I hope, I would hope it isn't his final film, is The Shape of Water, and I think you saw it more recently than I did, so why don't you briefly just describe what this movie's about, Parker? I think Guillermo likes to call it as a fairy tale for troubled times, and it's about a woman who's a janitor at a, you know, a top-secret military research lab, and she's mute, and she has some close friends. One is her, either her neighbor or he, they live together. I, I wasn't quite 100% clear <laughs> if they were roommates or friends. Yeah, played by Richard Jenkins. And by Richard Jenkins. He's a gay man. This is set in 1962, Cold War era. The woman's played by Sally Hawkins. And Octavia Spencer plays her co-worker, who's also a janitor at the research lab. And in the course of working there, they discover and she befriends and bonds with a Amazonian river man. And uh, they form a bond and a very tight bond that kind of blossoms into a romance. And the romance is threatened by the new head of security at the facility, played by... Michael Shannon, who's a tense. The fish man is played by Jug Jones, because of course he is. Um, <laughs> and a fish man part that is very different from Ape Sapien. I know that was mm -hmm. some confusion in the initial trailers. People thought it was like an Ape Sapien origin thing. It's not. It's a very different character from Ape Sapien in a lot of different ways. But did you notice that really all of our hero characters, from Richard Jenkins to Sally Hawkins, Octavia Spencer, Doug Jones, and a character played by... Um, Michael Stolbarg. Yes. Anyway, they're all outsiders, really, mm -hmm. or different, because Sally Hawkins is mute. Octavia Spencer is a black woman in the early 1960s. Richard Jenkins is gay. Obviously, the amphibian man is godlike foreign creature. And that's something that we didn't talk about in his other films, but has been a constant thing with him, that he's very much interested in the outsider characters, too. Like Hellboy, like Abe Sapien, like Liz Sherman, I think are some of the most prominent examples. And it's the character that is the well-off, white male character who is the villain of the piece it's the one that during that time maybe would be most trusted in society but in this film is the monster so to speak yeah definitely michael shannon's character is 
very reminiscent of the captain in yeah. Pan's Labyrinth. Both of those characters, they almost seem like they're harboring some like childhood trauma that's kind of shaped who they are. And they've just become these kind of rage-filled, resentful. They seem like they're deeply fragile on the inside. And they're trying to move past that with this very evil behavior. They don't know how um, to really interact with society. Yeah, exactly. And I think Guillermo does have a lot of compassion for people who are kind of outside I think in a lot of ways he kind of sees himself as kind of an outsider. You know, the fun kind of analogy that he likes to talk about is when he was six years old and he saw a creature from the Black Lagoon, he was rooting for the monster. He wanted the monster to get the girl. He thought that was what was supposed to happen. <laughs> he was a little disappointed. And so, you know, I think the seed of this is he wants to see a story where the monster gets the girl. It's like, how do you craft a story around that idea? You know, you talk about things that he's passionate about. As a fairy tale for troubled times, you know, I think the voices of these characters who they're being represented aren't really being heard right now. And we're talking about how do people communicate? Like the two characters that bond and connect in this film can't talk. And I think he's saying something about how we don't listen and we don't communicate and we don't try to understand the voices of the people who are downtrodden at times. And so there's a powerful message in this film and I think it's one of the things that people really connect with. Like we said, the hero characters are different and stand out from society. I think it's almost saying to embrace those people that are standing out from society. Don't try to push them out of society, embrace them instead. Don't hate them. Yeah, Sally Hawkins says Eliza Esposito, say, I think is her character's name. She talks about you know how this creature can see her as she really is so to everyone around her she is the mute woman but he himself this monster can't talk either and so you know this part of this bond is being able to put away your beliefs of what a person is just by their disability or their race or their religion or whatever and understand them for who they are and then until you can do that and you can communicate accept them then we're going to have trouble times and so i think it's a call for better understanding and better i don't want to say tolerant i don't think that's the right word you know i, you know, I think accepting you know it's it's almost like more than that there's going to be a connection and then that connection comes through that willful desire to just communicate and empathize with these groups and what they go through this movie is getting a lot of positive press right now it's getting a lot of positive press For sure how do you feel about the positive press it's getting do you agree with it do you think it's as good as a lot of people are saying it is or? it's a good question here's what i would compare it to i can definitely see why a lot of people are connecting with this movie i don't think it spoke to me personally as strongly i would compare this to my experience with crimson peak where i came out of it was like that was a good movie and i really appreciate the craft and everything that's gone into it and i know as i see it again and again and again i'll start to pick up more things and probably like it more i don't know if i would put it in my surefire oscar list or not there's no question that this movie is unlike anything else that's out there or anything else i've seen before <laughs> I mean, it is truly unique, and it comes straight from Guillermo's imagination. And the other thing is, I can't imagine anybody else being able to execute it as well as he did. The idea is kind of preposterous. <laughs> I mean, the only thing I can compare it to is Beauty and the Beast, which is a fairy tale, and it's set in a fairy tale land. This is 1962 Cold War America, and it's a janitor falling in love with a fish fan. That's a huge risk, and in a lot of ways, it's kind of a miracle the movie got made. The fact that Guillermo can execute this script in this movie in such a way that people see the beauty of it speaks highly to his ability as a director and a writer, which he co-wrote this, I think, with Vanessa Taylor. So kudos to both of them. But I feel like I need to see it a few more times before I can really say how much I like it. I will say in terms of the critical reception which it's getting which i very much appreciate that he's getting lauded for it i appreciate that doug jones is getting very lauded for his performance in this movie which i think is long overdue for him to get recognized as the actor that he is i think i'm similar to you in the fact that yeah i think it's a good movie but yeah it didn't hit me as personally as i think it's hitting other people i don't know quite why that is yet well i will say about it that i think is positive i mean beyond the other things that we said were positive like the themes and the characters and all that stuff is i think it's kind of 
him, I think, getting back on track a little bit. When I was watching his films again, I noticed his different phases, as it were, and I think those phases come out as Kronos and Mimic, first phase, which is very much mm-hmm. an experimental phase where he's discovering himself. Then Devil's Backbone, probably on through Pan's Labyrinth, was another phase where he's refining what he's doing and perfecting it. And then in Hellboy 2 through Crimson Peak, you see the color that he's using and the look of his films explode and gets even more extravagant and amazing. And then I think that's him starting to make films that you mentioned that his Spanish films used to be very personal for him. And starting with Hellboy 2, and he said this, that that line started to get blurred and to the point where with this film... He has said it's pretty much an English language version of a Spanish film that he would make. So I think this is a start of a new kind of era, new phase for him. So while I'm not as crazy about the film, maybe as some other people are, I like the direction I think he's going in, because I do like the feel of this movie, I like the look of this movie. If he keeps going in this direction, I think I'm going to be very happy with whatever he decides to do next, which I don't know what that's going to be, but he did say he's going to take a year break, but whatever he decides to do next, I will eagerly look forward to. When I went and saw it, there were people who were crying at the ending. They really deeply connected to the story and the characters. And, uh, you know, I think it sounds like you feel kind of the same way that maybe we didn't connect as emotionally as some other people. But uh, I'm really happy for Guillermo that the movie's getting this attention. I do want to watch it again. His movies are so difficult to, at least for me, to consume in a first sitting. (laughs) It's like kind of drinking from a fire hose. Some people never really go back and watch his movies. And if you do, you inevitably find things that you missed and clues to the story that make it more meaningful. It certainly was that way for me for Crimson Peak. And I know that I'm going to enjoy the movie more as I spend some more time with it. Do you have like a ranking of the films? It was probably cranked out of my brain and it would probably change tomorrow if you ask me again. (laughs) So I had I had number ten was Hellboy. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, you know I recently rewatched it with my sons, and uh, it didn't resonate with me as much as when I first saw it. <laughs> and I don't know if it just hasn't aged well or just my tastes have changed as I've gotten older. But I didn't connect with it the same way. It's kind of like when you go back to a movie that you really loved when you were a kid, and you're like, wow, I can't believe I really like that. I mean, it's not as extreme as that scenario. <laughs> I just think intellectually I've just changed. My tastes have changed. (laughs) And so it fell. Number nine was Kronos. Eight was Mimic. Seven, Hellboy 2. Six was Blade 2. Five was Pacific Rim. Four was Shape of Water. Three was Devil's Backbone. And I've moved Crimson Peak up to number two. Like I said, every time I watch it, I uh, appreciate it more. I think it's kind of one of his really underrated films that people should go back to. And then I still have Pan's Labyrinth as number one. I am very glad I had you do that because it is very different from mine. So mine, there's a tie here. So mine doesn't start at 10, it starts at 9 because there's a tie somewhere. Number nine is Mimic. It's to me the least satisfying of his films. It has to me the least I guess substance in a way. Hellboy 2 is number 8, which for me went down a lot. I think it's probably my Hellboy for you, in a similar way, went down a lot for you. Hellboy 2 went down a lot for me, just because I just didn't connect with the movie as well as I had before. I didn't enjoy as much before. I had more of a problem with the tone of the film than I had in the past. Number 7 is sadly Crimson Peak. I don't know, I might feel different if I watched it again. That was only my second time watching the film, so it might change. But I didn't quite enjoy it as much. I don't know if it's because I knew the answers to the mystery or what, but didn't enjoy it as much. Uh, number six, and this was a hard choice. Again, I've only seen the movie once, so it's very well could change. This is, so this isn't quite set in stone, but probably number six is Shape of Water, which I enjoyed, and I think it was a good movie, but I just didn't connect with it as much and enjoy it as much as some of his other films, and I think as much as other people. Are. Number five, and this might be surprising for people, who have just seen Shape of Water and are loving it. But I put Blade 2 because while in certain ways Shape of Water is a better film than Blade 2, I just think Blade 2 is a lot of fun. And I enjoyed watching that film a lot. Number four, Pacific Rim. Again, the last time I watched it, it really worked for me more than it ever had before. But again, that could change if I watch it again. Number three, 
three, Devil's Backbone. Number two is Kronos, which I think is probably higher than a lot of people would put that film. But again, I'm just really, really, really fond of that movie. And I enjoyed it a lot when I watched it again recently. And number one is a tie, because I just could not decide. It's between Hellboy and Pan's Labyrinth. Hellboy I picked partially because I enjoy that film a lot. I will admit, not as much of it worked for me the last time I watched it as had in the past. But so a lot of it worked for me. And also just in terms of, for me, how important that film is to me and what it led to in terms of friendships and all that stuff. In that way, it kind of goes beyond the film in a way. It has to do with a lot of stuff with me personally. That's kind of one reason why that is so high. Then Pad's Labyrinth is totally a quality thing in terms of how good the movie is and how much all of it works. And not to say I haven't done any good films since then, but he still, for me, hasn't reached the height of Pan's Labyrinth yet. Maybe he will again at some point. You and I were really off on Hellboy, Kronos, and Crimson Peak. We had those kind of flip-flopped on the scale. Yes, very much so. We had some similarities, but those two were very, will, very different. I will say that I would agree with you. Like Pacific Rim and Blade 2 have high rewatchability. Those are two movies that, like, if you're flipping the channels on cable and they're on, you just stop. And you can just pick up wherever it's starting and watch it. Because it's one of the they're just fun movies to rewatch over and over again. I think we kind of mentioned Blade 2 is just... It's the best, I think, of his action movies. I do, too. But if he made more movies like that, maybe in between other movies that are more like Shape of Water, I would totally go see them. I hope he's not done making those kind of types of movies, because... I don't think so. I think his next movie will be one of those. I hope so. And I don't know what it's going to be. I don't remember if I specifically mentioned this. I mentioned that we were both interested in him doing a black and white film. And a couple years ago, I think around the time of Crimson Peak, he mentioned he wants to do a black and white film about a basically a Mexican wrestler who is fighting against vampire politicians which is Mm -hmm. a ridiculous idea for a movie and one i'm not sure if it will work or not but i have faith in it just because it's him doing it i don't know if it's ever gonna get made but he says he wants to do that in black and white i don't know his reasons for wanting to do that in black and white but i would be very Uh, interested in seeing that well he in some aspects he kind of did it with silver angel in his strain series he even directed like a black and white sequence of in the strain of the silver angel i think his next film most likely will be fantastic voyage Oh, he has talked about that, yeah. The remake of the old sci-fi film of people getting shrunk and injected into a human body. I think that's probably the most likely candidate. But like you said, he's going to be on a year-long sabbatical, so anything can happen. Yeah, and I can't remember if he officially said this was canceled and not happening. I did a brief Google search of it recently. I didn't find anything saying that, but I'm still holding out hope that when he was making Pan's Labyrinth, one of his movies he said he wanted to make was a film called Saturn and the End of Days, which I think this was going to be a Spanish-language film. It was a movie about a little boy who witnesses the apocalypse while he's going back and forth between the grocery store, which I love as a concept more than any film he has mentioned that he has not been able to make that he at least at one time wanted to make i hope still wants to make that is the one that's interested me the most i don't know if that's ever going to happen i know certain films that he's wanted to do he's outright said are canceled i don't know about that one it almost seems like a hundred percent of the movies that he does since i've been involved kind of chronicling his career have been a complete surprise. No idea that it was coming. Like, oh, Pacific Rim? Never heard of it. This, that's never come up before. Same thing with Crimson Peak. No clue. He always has, like, these projects floating around. Like, oh, he's attached to this. Oh, he may do the Dark Justice League or whatever. He may do Pacific Rim 2. And every single time, it's been a complete surprise. So I've just kind of stopped guessing. <laughs> yeah. And it should be mentioned, I've seen some people complain that he drops projects and stuff. He doesn't drop projects with his philosophy that he learned, I think, after devil's backbone or around that time is basically to have multiple projects working at any one time Mm -hmm. on the frying pan so that Mm -hmm. if one of them falls through one of the other ones might work so it's not that he just gives up on projects it's that he has multiple things going and he doesn't give up on the other things like his frankenstein that i think he still wants to really make or his at the mountains of madness which i think he said he'll try that one more time before he gives up on it so keep that in mind for anybody out there who's frustrated with him not doing justice league dark or whatever he's not lost interest in a lot of these things he's just working on other things until we can hopefully make some of those so i think that about wraps us up is there anything else you want to say parker before i wrap this no up? thanks for having me on the podcast i enjoyed it so uh, thanks again to parker and later on this month we're going to be talking about the best picture oscar nominees again until then though i will catch you guys later
You can find me on Twitter at CinemaPackRats. Links to my WordPress and YouTube account where you can find film and television news and reviews can be found in the episode's description. 